Okay, so this is very exciting because the model is certainly lining up with being able to tell you the component constituent parts of someone's personality and what they have where. Um, but it is slightly still conjecture in terms of all the internal mechanics. So this is slightly speculative. The, the, the details that I'm going to go into, I think, will be broadly, in the broad sense, they will be true. And where they are technically or in, in the detail untrue, there will be a very similar kind of mechanism uh, that just puts emphasis on on something that is quite adjacent to what it is that I would be describing. So it's, it might be sort of a shift in emphasis. Um, and then the thing that I mentioned was just a kind of a sympathetic sort of uh, permu permutation of, of, of the more uh, prime causative uh, mechanic. So th there will be, I think, a refinement in that line and not so much a refinement in having to um, radically redraw things. But you know, so, but everything I say must be sort of taken with a pinch of salt. And there are some clear sets of variations which I cannot prefer within my interpretation at the moment. Um, so let me just dive into it. So um, I've also been thinking uh, as to as to just some some general introductory remarks about how the system or how the model of of mind sort of functions and why it functions so essentially in mbti mbti has to rely on what i would call generally generally pretty good approximations they have to have a lot of stricture a lot of sort of um you know, I mean, and a lot of these are very recent discoveries. For instance, um, the cognitive axes, that was a, a technical breakthrough because with that model, uh, you, you're able to get a lot more out of interpreting MBTI types. I don't have to have those kinds of ad hoc technical uh, sorts of um, chunks of theory added onto my theory because uh, the, the source material, the 17 cognitive functions that I have, have an inbuilt sequence, have a natural, uh, are part of a natural uh, structure, which, uh, and, 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 and it's very relevant, the um, the, the their own internal natural ordering has a lot of st structural things that are similar in 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 a kind of in, in a technical way to a lot of those sorts of ad hoc additions th that you that have been uh, essentially added on to MBTI. It's only very recent that that the cognitive fun uh, that the axes of, of cognitive functions. Was sort of added in and that also allowed for things like four sides of the mind to be extrapolated from mbti um, so my model of the four sides of the mind is very different and it ends up uh, because it, because it is a um a consecutive structured sort of developing organic sort of pattern that then is overlaid onto the 17 um, model and that will give someone a distinct pattern of cognitive functions uh, with some internal structures uh, uh, that I can already outline quite easily and then I just don't know the precise details of how those internal structures impinge on one another I'm not sure exactly which one is is the causative sort of prime mechanic in which one is is merely sort of sympathetically receiving the impingement from the other structures and how much of it is sort of um, a consortium of, of certain internal forces. So that's kind of just an overview of, of the difference between MBTI and, and my system. So as, as I already said, that the, the main units 
within my system is a, is a, a six or a seven unit. So each side of the mind in a primordial sense is composed of, of seven segments, um, one of which is external to that side of the mind, which it, re which it relies on, and six of them which are what I would call positive structure in, with, with regard to that particular side of the mind. So each side of the mind requires something outside of itself. And this is why I don't regard the superego as really being part of the false ego complex. That there is one element from the superego, which is kind of the initiator of the false ego complex. And so the superego really is, is, a, is a separate entity in some sense. And my explanation as to how this happens uh, in terms of someone's development into a particular development of the false ego complex is that essentially um, a single element in uh, the parent function of the superego is developed and is related to as a separate entity. And I believe that w when this happens, uh, the young mind or the the young psyche perhaps even this begins pre pre verbally uh, before language uh, develops tries to get a hold of their environment by creating a, an anthropomorphized um figurehead or avatar of their environment so Another way of, of saying this is that uh, the baby, perhaps, or the very young infant, or, the, or, or perhaps it's slightly later on, but essentially what will happen is that uh, the child will believe that they are experiencing emotions from the environment. And I do think that this is perhaps why in, in early life, um, children have this kind of this this theta the, these more theta brain waves and they are in this dreamlike state is because uh, they have in their minds taken a part of their own cognition that would naturally fall within one of their own would be one of their own cognitive functions and they have elected that cognitive function to be an effigy or an avatar of their environment to be the spokesperson of their environment and although right at the start you they might have a kind of dialogue with that figment with that sort of quasi fictional sort of uh, uh, conceptualization of their environment that eventually that figure sort of blends into the background it just kind of, it gets, uh, especially as the, the false ego complex starts to develop. And so another way of looking at this is that that representation of the environment that is made out of one, one's own cognitive faculties, uh, which then obviously that cognitive faculty has to be um, set aside. It has to kind of be made into, into a collective other or into the collective environment. Um, I think in scripture, I would relate this to the concept of the God of the world. Um, or particularly what this faculty is doing, it is, it is acting as a false prophet, uh, because it is, it is representing the God of the world, uh, and inducting the child or, or, or whatever, it, uh, you know, the, the, the the growing dialogue or, or whatever um, it, it is inducting the 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 psyche that it is attached to almost like a parasite um, into believing that all the experiences garnered by that psyche are by its being encompassed in the cognitive domain of that and I'm going to say like anthropomorphized figure as as another or as the collective other or something like that 
Um, and I, I think that I've already tried to, to say why I think that ideas like the collective unconscious are, are actually fundamentally toxic. And I've, I've tried to get into some themes of that. And I think that this is kind of where that, this is where the primordial force of that toxicity sort of comes from, is that this thing is, is, uh, is in a epistemological sense, um, responsible for the experience received. Or, or it is implicitly given responsibility for, for one's experiences. Now, to confuse matters further, I think that this, this thing does blend into the background and it is largely forgotten, except until the ego comes back into the picture. The ego kind of brings, it, brings this issue back into focus. It kind of gets you back into looking behind the curtain of the Wizard of Oz, as it were. But anyway, um, I'm... In early development, uh, what is actually happening is that with the subconscious, which is the first positive development that is primed by the superego or this element from the superego, which is its parent function. Now, I haven't repeated the whole the whole sort of seven part structure, but essentially, um, so seven part structure. Uh, especially for the other, the, the, the proceeding sides of the mind that aren't the superego, it's not something, you're not dealing with something that just has a parent function. It, it, you also are dealing with something that has its own, that has its own child function and, it, and its own hero. But a parent function by itself will also have an inferior function. And it will also have what I call a sin, which isn't usually regarded, uh, well, that isn't known within MBTI. So it doesn't have a prominent, let's say, archetype that I can kind of point at or whatever. So, so you have a parent function and you have an inferior function and you have a sin. And even the superego has those three things right from the start. And the point of it having an inferior function is so it can try to Every parent function, apart from the ego's parent function, doesn't like its inferior function, um, or they all don't like their inferior function, but they can do something about not liking it. They have an extra trick that they can play, and that is that essentially they can, they can that parent function can play trickster with that inferior function and hand it off to a new entity. And that is what the next side of the mind always is. It is that new entity that adopts their inferior function as the unwanted child, essentially. Because in each side of the mind, the child function is cool, the, the hero function is cool, uh, and, and the parent function is just worried about the inferior function. That, that's how I see things. Or it's the parent function's job to relate to the inferior function. It's also, I believe, the parent function's job is to create structures to relegate other prior sides of the mind, inferior functions, to keep them taken for granted as the death. Because an inferior function, because you only, a parent function only wants to worry about its own local inferior function. It doesn't want to have to worry about other sides of the mind's inferior functions. Because if it did so, that means that its parent structure is no longer in vogue, it's no longer in force, it's no longer ascendant or prominent. And therefore, the, let's say, the perspectives of the other sides of the mind are going to be at least concurrent, if not ascendant and sort of driving you into essentially being as a seat of consciousness focused on the other side of the mind. So if a parent function is not capable of relegating prior sides of the mind's inferior functions and keeping them taken for granted as, as costed into the environment, as costed into the, the precondition needed in order to value their own child function, in order to... to um, build a nice ivory tower that is their own hero function. Uh, you can't enjoy that ivory tower unless the other inferior functions are um, reduced as worries and they are costed into the, the foundation of this side of the mind. And so if the parent function is not willing or able to 
to um and, and this is why i also think that parent functions might have some cross pollination because maybe also there can be certain kinds of psychopathologies that because i think all the structure that determines which side of the mind that you're in is in the parent function man i am really jumping around badly but uh, but essentially so another to put it another way the inferior function and the sin of each side of the mind is repurposed as the death and the lust of another side of the mind and by the way the lust is the child function so one side of the mind's sin is another side of the mind's child function or the next side of the mind's child function and so what what is abject failure to the parent function on one side of the mind, the sin, because that is what you have missed the mark of. That is what you have. It's actually, it's, it's very painful because it kind of, it invalidates your whole side of the mind because you didn't get what you wanted. You had to put up with your inferior function at the, and at the end of the day, you didn't, you missed the mark. Uh, you did, you didn't. And the sin is basically painful to the to the child function the the sin is the end is the proof that that you have failed your own child function so the parent function really doesn't like the sin um, and the parent function already tried to run control to run some kind of way to 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 sort of change things up but essentially the sin is also a kind of proof that the parent function is impotent uh, and that the whole side of their mind is just without value or merit. Uh, it just, it just, it, it, it uh, uh, ends in, in just essentially, uh, it's, it's really, an, an, it's an existential threat, the sin is. And so it's very important that what the parent function tries to do is it tries to create a new sense of self, a new side of the mind, to adopt these concerns and to perhaps use them as ingredients to start the project off again, and then maybe it will have a, a way of, of sort of doubling down and, and getting it and getting the child function. So essentially, what is left behind when you go to other sides of the mind is this hope that maybe the child functions will all be redeemed. They aren't, but that, that is the hope. Um, and I, I, would, I would like to speculate as to all the different theories of, of thera therapeutic processes, but it's not, it's not the time to do that in this recording. Um, I should really do that at the end, but... Um, Okay, so I'll just point out that it's 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 a very important feature that the super ego doesn't have a child function, doesn't have a lust to begin with. So that that's important. Um, okay, so another way of of looking at this is that. Um, and I, and I have the description of this, which I still haven't integrated fully into this model. Um, because I'm not sure, I'll speculate as to wh where I see it fitting in, but it, I, I'm still actually sort of at, at a loss at exactly how, how this gets integrated. But I've got the parts of the puzzle, I just need to kind of arbitrarily line them up until it looks like that, that it all works. But um, there might not also be a, a direct sort of parallel and it might sort of be a bit metaphorical, but the level of detail, I mean, that you have even without connecting these up in a fixed correlation is just, is mind blowing how amazing and, and in depth the psychology is. But essentially, the, I said that the superego is responsible for producing the experience of the other sides of the mind, or which I say are the real false ego complex does not really include the super ego. And so in some sense, the, what I call the false ego complex is experiencing something which is produced by the super ego or the experience that is produced by the super ego is, um, is, is being developed 
and, and being structured by the positive sides of the mind or the positive side of the false ego complex. And so I see this as a kind of, as the, the positive sides of the mind are positively taking responsibility for the experience which is epistemologically being sourced from the superego. So the, the superego is like a negative picture that is being developed. You know, so, so you take, uh, you know, the, the negative light uh, sort of, um, and you shine a light through it, a white light through it, and you get, um, you get a positive development. And so essentially the, 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 the positive sides of the mind are, are, are the progressive development of that positive picture that the superego has built into it. And so the more responsibility that the positive sides of the mind take for the experience being provided by the superego, in some sense, the more it is displacing it, the, the more it, it, in some sense, it's, it's, in some sense, maybe it's mimicking this, but, but it's, it can find recourse within its own structures as to why it has the experience that it's experiencing. So it has a, it can sort of develop a sense of agency that it's not merely being, okay, now, now the, these two, do, these two things um, are important to set up, and I, I know it seems very complicated, but the, the reason why it's important to set up these things is because the false ego complex kind of has to be complete right at the start, even though it hasn't been very much, it hasn't been developed very much. And so this is why the superego is important, is that the superego fills in the gaps. So you can't cycle, you don't have enough developmental structure that has even reached the level of the ego when you just start off developing your subconscious. So everything in your unconscious and in your ego, which you haven't yet positively developed, you still have to uh, have those parts of the puzzle in order to cycle your false ego complex. In order to operate your false ego complex, it has to kind of already be complete. And so whatever you don't inculcate within yourself as structure, you have to project on a drama, onto some kind of sequence. You have to project it onto your environment. So in some sense, you could say that the other sides of your mind, which you don't yet take responsibility for, other people or other elements in your environment have to embody that contribution. And then you have to sort of be codependent in a system in that in that sort of drama in order to be a complete unit relative to the superego and so when when people are in a in a um i was doing some thinking about this now i can't remember the words that i used but you know when when people essentially are making a composite to help take, you know, people like to be part of groups, you know, and, and things like that, uh, that, that, that provide to them this kind of collateral support, because then they can freely project onto others the parts of themselves which they haven't worked out how to integrate. Um, they haven't worked out how to reconcile them. Uh, and the hardest part of reconciliation is really the level of the ego, because the ego is already, in, in terms of the positive structure, you can only start to really make some headroom uh, or headway in, in developing the ego if you are actively troubleshooting the, the, the tension between the positive sides of the mind. So, and while you are dealing with the positive tension of the sides of the mind, you're also dealing with the super ego, who is perhaps trying to pull the rug out from under the ego's feet, because essentially the ego is is um, is really revealing some things about the super ego. The because the sin of the ego, which is very hard for the ego to develop, uh, an appreciation of its own sin, because the parent function of the ego has no new side of the mind to hand anything to. Um, the, the ego does not 
get to the ego does not treat the super ego um, like the next side of the mind because the only way to, to be able to pass off your um, your your inferior function and your sin to a new side of the mind is that that, that new side of the mind has to use your inferior function as its death because then it's taking responsibility for costing in the inferior function and then it has to value that sin uh, which it repurposes as its lust that forces a certain crystallization of the uh, which is linked to the crystallization you see essentially the lust is uh, or the child function fundamentally gets to toy with it, its own cognitive function it gets to toy with itself uh it, it gets a certain level of of unlimited use of, of itself it can just say whatever it want to uh, whatever it wants to because if on the prior dimension you have costed something in as a hard limit as a death of that dimension in some sense you have what, what the death actually is is that it's the replacement of that cognitive function with an image, with a dead image, with a, with a, with a still frame position. And essentially, because these cognitive operations are dynamic, if they are premised on something that is static, you can essentially do whatever you want with it, because it just becomes a bit of a semantic sort of game of, of horse trading in some sense. So the, the, Actually, I mean, the child function or the lust actually gets itself in knots because it's too li libertine. It, 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 it's too uh, liberal with its own power. And in some sense, it's, it's sort of it's, it's so drunk on its own mastery and power uh, based, uh, which is essentially predicated on, on the death of the lost dimension um, or sorry, the lost cognitive function. Um, because these are all consecutive, the death and then the lust. Uh, is that it actually, the, the only thing that it wants for, and the only thing that it can't have, because it's so powerful in terms of that cognitive function, uh, it's so pure in terms of that cognitive function, is integrity. In some sense, it, it, it lacks corroboration from its death, because its death is just enslaved to supporting it as a pedestal. And so it lacks sort of, at ascendant uh, uh, sort of validation, as it were. Um, and so what then compensates for this is, is the hero function, which is the preceding uh, cognitive function, which is, uh, I've also described it as the ivory tower that is being built or, or whatever, but it, it's, it's the vanity. It is um, the drawn out... Uh, meaning of the lust in the context of that next cognitive function so the vanity is the elaboration of the lust in this new domain in this new cogn in, in in the vogue of, of this new cognitive function um, and then essentially that structure because the vanity really is large it really is sophisticated it really is robust The thing is, is that it's so robust that it kind of, it stops feeling powerful because it has to know what the price of everything is. It has to kind of know where all the bodies are buried. So it actually gets the job done. It creates a city in the image of the lust. Uh, uh, this is really the same as, as, the, as the Whore of Babylon. Um, sort of uh, as, as it's described in um, the whore of Babylon uh, is the is the is the queen of Babylon but she's not called the queen because she can't have the integrity but she she is served by all the kings and the rich merchants who are drunk on the wrath of fornication with her so 
you know, all the values, all the rich values and, and sophisticated, you know, different rulers and, and, and kings of the city, of this great city, uh, they are inebriated, they are alcoholics, and their, their drink is their anger, and they get that anger from fornication with the queen. And that is really the, the perfect archetypal description of what's going on here within the vanity. And so the parent function is like the sheriff in town in some sense, and or, or the server, and it has to keep on serving up those drinks. It has to make sure that there, there is no gap in the inebriation for, for sense, because, because the vanity would tear itself apart in some sense, because... It actually gets the job done, but at what cost? And can it actually bear the cost? And so somehow there has to be a helper to make the cost bearable, and that is the enticed lust, that is the parent function, that has to create a new, a new reason for doing this. It has to create a new intrigue about the lust, about the child function. The parent function has to, has to create a... a, a, a an aegis for, for the child function, a new reason. It has to be a new way of, of talking about how the child function is, is being uh, catered to. And it has to create an, a, a notion of integrity for the child function, which never existed from the vanity. So somehow the parent function has to, has to perform this role. So it's really just, it's kind of like the security guard. It's kind of like the, the protection um, the bodyguard, something like that. What else? Okay, so, and the fairy and the inferior function is is reigning on this parade, and and eventually the trial, which is the inferior function will prove that the that the parent function has failed because the parent function is is actually quite frankly it's delusional it's deluded it's self-deluded um and the sin is essentially the recognition that that the lust has been negated uh, has has not been able is actually not all powerful it's sort of the proof positive that the whole thing is is a failure now it is slightly more complicated than that because that parent function also i believe isn't just doesn't just have to deal with its local inferior function but i believe that in in some perhaps in an indirect and a bit of a convoluted way it has to make sure that the other parent functions that it, it that that this whole side of the mind is premised on are performing its role in in donating their local inferior functions as the death of this because the parent function still needs a death for its child it still needs to make sure that it it's its lust that it tries to serve needs that death that it it needs a second maybe the what the parent function is trying to do is to provide a second corroborating story about how the death makes all of this excusable and necessary so the parent function really is playing a meta structural buttress uh that perhaps sees the prior side of the mind and perhaps it looks itself into the next side of the mind if, if it is not the ego if it's the subconscious or the unconscious then it's maybe looking to kind of play for a new team and something like that where it's like well maybe the only way to save my lust my child function for my side of the mind is if I jettison the, my inferior, my local inferior function and hand it on to the next parent function of the, of the next side of the mind. And so I kind of have, so, so there might be a kind of a special structural chain between these parent functions where, and I don't know how to picture this, that, that these parent functions I think are, 
they either function independent, relatively independently, obviously with certain re requisites being complied with. Obviously, I think that, but it could be that each side of the mind, both the subconscious, the unconscious, and and the ego function, sorry, uh, the ego uh, side of the mind, all develop simultaneously, roughly simultaneously at the same time. But as they develop, they might also impinge on on one another. Um, I think that that might just be generally true, but obviously perhaps the unconscious perhaps can't even get itself off the ground properly until the subconscious has a certain requisite level of structure because it's very hard to kind of, um, you, can't, you can't really found a new side of the mind until the inferior function of the old side of the mind has manifested to a point at which, or has developed to a point at which it can kind of inculcate a... Um, you know, a, a robust enough death to produce a stable enough um, character for uh, uh, in terms of of the child function of that new side of the mind needs needs a solid foundation perhaps, or it could be that maybe it can be a bit piecemeal that somehow all the parent functions can somewhat be developing simultaneously and then the child functions get inserted a bit later and then they have, and then the structures of those parent functions, you know, so, I mean, all these things might be sort of independent players that sort of eventually have to integrate as their side of the mind sort of fills itself out to some degree, but they, so they have internal tensions that, that they, that they, of roles that they need to play. And then they have sort of cross pollinated um, impingements, which, you know, and, and some sides of the mind might have some of those cross-pollinated impingement. And the biggest source for these cross-pollinated impingements, I would say, is the superego, because the superego is, everyone with the same metatype is not necessarily the same. They are the same based on the superego experience that is being provided to the to the meta type structure so the meta type architecture might be the same for a whole for different people that have a different style of super ego projection or a different style of super ego experience that the positive sides of the mind are developing uh, under the tutelage thereof as they are absorbing um, responsibility for the experience that the superego is is providing in the background so essentially as the as the positive sides of the mind gain grow in responsibility for taking responsibility away from the superego they develop uh structures that 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 um supplant the superego experience but essentially that, that the superego experience is the is the seed which is um growing as it were uh, and developing in a positive way and i'll just say that there are within my system i don't just have the meta structure i have a description of those i call them emotional circuits so there are particular emotional circuits which means that certain elements are elevated above other elements and so there is a bit of a story that you can take from the emotional circuits and it'll tell you which elements and which sides of the mind, in terms of the positive sides of the mind, will 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 be sort of like command posts, or will be more will be the touchstones of the structure of the system. And I still don't know how to exactly describe this overlay, because it could just be that these emotional tones are in a in a meta sense they, they they can they can only be metaphorically overlaid and it could be that well maybe this is just what the parent functions are doing that in some sense the parent functions are the ones that are actually that have a view of this super ego um, circuitry and so what, whichever parent function takes responsibility um, for the super ego circuitry uh, um, emotional circuitry uh, 
they will project those emotional circuits on the other parent functions that aren't doing their job. And then that parent function will be projected onto the drama in the environment. So in some sense, if you don't, if your parent function inside of you doesn't take responsibility, then like the super ego will kind of, um, abduct that parent function and have it play the role of that emotional circuit and will sort of and you will see that embodied in your environment as either a condition in your environment or an exterior influence and so basically it's either the choice is it's either going to be part of an external locus of control which is operated by the super ego or it's going to be operated in terms of an internal locus of control uh, whether you've integrated it into your parent circuitry or whatever and in some sense I think you can even if, if you I don't think it I think it's very close to the to the parent function but it doesn't have to be because you could even break it up further because these emotional circuits there are only three but they are six they they there are they may they are made up of three distinct things but they have a, a sequence to them they have an internal sequence and that sequence has six parts so it could be the parent functions of the um it could be just three of the parent functions and then they have Each parent function relates to two inferior functions. It's local inferior function and the inferior function of the prior self. And so I think that in some sense you could say that it it that the the emotional tone circuitry, because it has six elements, but three of them are, 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 are because there's a particular sequence that, that then essentially that is showing the drama that the super ego is doing to the positive side of the mind. And so essentially people, depending on that sequence, will actually have a particular style of cognition, which will kind of cycle within themselves through a certain sequence through the sides of the mind. So like some people will, will have, uh, and, and, and this, people that have different sequences are, have a different subtype within the metagram circuitry, uh, emotional circuitry. Emotional circuitry is metagram and the architecture is metatype. So the metatype architecture is, is very solid and that's like MBTI. But then the metagram circuitry is kind of like a combination of MBTI and much deeper, deeper detailed analysis. So this is why my system is just so much more sublim sublimely amazing than any other typology because the specificity is just mind-blowing uh, but anyway um so obviously i haven't found a way to, to actually marry this precisely but i think basically the main subspecies of metagram circuitry or there may be other ways in which you can produce other subspecies because there's some people that have double circuits and some people that have single circuits and that, I think, is also the explanation as to why some people have bipolar type 1 or have the potential to develop bipolar type 1 and bipolar type 2. Although, I, actually, I think that if you have bipolar type 1, you have the potential to develop it. If you have bipolar type 2, I think you will always pretty much develop it. I, I don't think... Uh, but anyway... Um, So that would be another set of subsets, but but the other subset would be what I would take from Hinduism when they talk about uh, sattva, rajas, and tamas, and those those uh, emotional tones are um, the different structure of them. Essentially, means that they will have a particular. It, starting point and ending point of their cycle which does repeat again and again and again but essentially the starting the starting emotional tone is in some sense the ground zero of the whole structure so the super ego has to be made from an initial image 
when you are the very, very young child, you have to anthropomorphize your environment based on a, on, a, on a prime image, on a prime death, as it were. And because it is the first image, because I, in some sense, I think all the emotional tone circuitry things are images on images on images on, on images, because it's kind of like a, it's an outcome. It's a, um, it's almost like a teleological sort of roadmap or, or something like that. Um, but it is in, impregnated in this kind of, in this weird kind of symbolic associative imagery or, or, or whatever. So it's, you know, it, it's, it, it's not a complete fictitious entity that has a, a human voice you you can make it, it it says you know maybe when you're very young you can talk to it but eventually it, it just becomes part of the background because it starts to explode itself in in associative complexity especially as the positive sides of the mind start to render it as as, as a vanity your first hero function will completely destroy whatever connection you might have had to the super ego as as a as a as a condensed fictitious entity that, that, that you could talk to. Um, anyway, um, the, the point here is that, um, the first image will probably perhaps be the most detailed or the strongest because it's what loops back to itself. And so it has the most efficacy or something like that. It has the most elaborate internal cohesion or, or whatever. And so the emphasis on that first image, as it goes through its own chain, it kind of loses steam in some sense. And so the, the super ego as a, as a blueprint is something that is, is, is very structured at, at, this, at the beginning of the, of the building of that blueprint. And at the end, it's, the most, it, it's, it's more exhausted and then it leads back to itself. And so... There will always be an emphasis as to which sides of the mind will be stronger than others or will be more developed than others. When you develop the positive side of your emotional tone, uh, when you develop the positive side of, of your false ego complex, some of the things are going to be the main foundations of the house and some of the things are going to be offshoot supports. And so the internal strength of the sides of the mind, I think are going to be roughly predetermined by the super ego um, subspecies, uh, as it were. And so I, I think this is when I explored some of my recordings, the concept of natural supremacy, that some types will have a natural proficiency over others. And one of the most important proficiencies I regard is um, the ego. The ego is so important. So few people have properly developed egos. Um, and I, I think that some people might be at such a structural deficit in terms of just their subspecies doesn't allow them to get to the point at which they, they, they would be developing their ego where they can have enough... enough um, I mean, it's still possible, but I think it's it's um, because of maybe that maybe the ego was developed first, and uh, be, be, because of because of the emotional tone sequence, maybe, maybe the ego was was the first thing, and so because the ego developed first, it can't really integrate the other sides of the mind, and so it just gets bogged down by its own internal tension between the other sides of the mind. So, so that might be what tamas is, because tamas is always uh, in in the in the sort of in the Hindu typology of the three types of personality. Tamas is described as lazy and indolent and ignorant, but the ignorance is really emphasized that it has a self opaqueness, and sattva uh, is called the golden type and is and is more transparent to itself, and perhaps sattva has the strongest leg up in terms of its ego development. Now, I want to talk about strategies of, of maturation and development, because I do think that perhaps all of these can be remedied by certain 
teaching perhaps uh, and, and certain understanding of psychology might might facilitate a better development of the ego. I, I do think that, you know, we're in contemporary culture, we're living through a crazy time where people are developing ADHD at rates that they never developed it before. And I can see, I can see psychological reasons for this. I mean, I, uh, I can, I can also see solutions to certain psychopathological, I mean, I, I believe I cured my own bipolar type one, um, which is certainly on the face of it a bit of a medical miracle because usually people with my type of bipolar type 1 can never not have an incident if they um if they are go unmedicated which I have gone unmedicated for quite an extensive period of time uh, and I believe that I fixed myself with my own um psychology uh but but anyway um it's just an anecdote uh So the thing here is that um, okay, so I, now, now I'm going to be conjecturing about first of all maturing uh, and developing good positive structures, healthier positive structures. Um, So, uh, and okay, there, there are a few things that I still need to talk about and go into, which are slightly tangential to, to maturing, but I should talk about them sort of at the same time. <clears throat> that Okay, so remember that I said that the sin of the ego is the death of the superego. So that means that if the ego can see its own sin, if it can reach, if its parent function can allow it to go through the trial and to really absorb that damage that the, uh, that the, that the inferior function is doing to its hero function, um, if, it, if it can do that, then it can, it can actually start to precipitate its sin. And the, the sin of the ego is so important. You, you must embrace the sin of the ego because if you if you are mindful of the sin of your ego you can start to uncover the super ego from the inside because eventually what you, you you're doing is you you are shedding light on a potential structure and backstory of the super ego and so the ego through through its sin can start to uncover what the lust of the superego would be as as you uncover the death then you could also take that further and uncover the lust and also the vanity oh, and so in some sense the ego has through its sin a tool to uncover and excavate the the, the superego structure now this, there might be other methods of dealing with this, but I think that in some sense this is needed in order to contain the superego and to start to get a handle of it. Um, because, the, because once you've got, once the superego has legs and it, and it can operate as another side of the mind, which is effectively only capable, you're only capable of reaching that level when the ego is developed uh, uh, well, well, uh, well enough to do so, then you can really see what's going on. Now, just because you can see what's going on doesn't mean that you can do any better yet. Um, I'm going to talk about what the actual solution is. So what the actual solution is, is to not have a child function. But you can't just stop the child function. You can't just stop one part of this machine and then the whole thing stops. It's not going to happen because you've got other mechanisms and support mechanisms and sympathy mechanisms that are still running. So there's no way that you're just going to be able to pack up the child function and the whole thing isn't just going to turn into a jumbled, entangled mess that never ends and that you're lost in. But if you're conscious of all the things, when you stop the lust, when you stop the child functions, then you can actually clean up 
the residue. You can clean up the aftermath, as it were, because you know how everything works. And so you can troubleshoot it as it comes up. And so as your vanity might sort of recompile itself, you debug the vanity because essentially you have implicitly, if the vanity exists, that then the child function is in, in place again. And so I've just skipped ahead one step. Um, so actually what I would say is the method of fixing this is that you have to, what I call, perfect the vanity. And the reason why I say perfect the vanity is that I don't want people to have a parent function. I don't want them to have an inferior function, and I don't want them to have a sin. Although I, I do want them to have the sin. Uh, the sin is the most important thing. They must know what, what their sin is. If they don't know what their sin is, then they have no hope of, of repentance or, or, or any kind of self-actualization or any kind of... What, what are they integrating? What are they developing? So the sin is important. But in some sense, the parent function and the inferior function are just ways to arrive at what the sin is going to be. They're, 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 it's the procedure that you have to go through. I don't want people to go through that procedure. I want them to know what their sin will be in their vanity. They need to integrate their, their inferior function and their vanity. They need to join those two things. So, and to do that, they need to use their parent function instrumentally as a, as a kind of utilitarian, pedagogical sort of training program. And so eventually, essentially, what needs to happen is that the vanity needs to become a perfect knowledge. It has to, the vanity has to become essentially a vanity of knowing its own weaknesses in some sense. And so to put this another way, the, the, what the vanity needs to do is it needs to allow the inferior function to hurt itself, to, 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 to damage the, the hero function so that the hero function can rebuild in a stronger way. And the parent function needs to step out of, out of the way because essentially what, what has been happening is that the parent function has been match fixing between the inferior function and the hero function to make the hero function look good. The, 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 the parent function has been the hero function's promoter because its interests are aligned in, in helping the child function. So the parent function needs to be silent and sit in the corner, but it still has to do its job to some degree because it has to deal with the inferior functions of maybe the other sides of the mind. So it has to make itself a non-issue. It has to make itself a kind of static thing. And then, so it has to try to, it's because it, stepping out of the way is not negating it. It still has to do a job, but it has to do its job differently. So that, that's a bit of a hard sort of tightrope for it to walk in some sense. Because it, it kind of has to be part of the process. Because the, the hero function is only going to be able to, to experience the inferior function in some sense via the filtration of the parent function. So the parent function has to be controlled. Now the ego function can control the vanity. And it can control the parent function. And it can control the inferior function. Because these parts of the ego are what you are doing with your mind. They are the aspect of, of the positive false ego complex that are literally under your control. You have the full effort to control those parts of your ego. You cannot control your child because you see your child you inherited from your unconscious side of the mind. Your, your child function in your ego is also the unconscious's sin. So you, your, 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 your lust in your, uh, your child function in your ego is beyond your control. You can't change it because it, it's part of the, the hardware of the ego. But your ego functions vanity, that's on you. You, you decide in your mind what, what your ego functions vanity, what the contents thereof are. You decide your, your ego functions parent. You decide how you use that. I mean, you can't, you can't make it something else, but you can decide how you use it. That's fully under your control. So with these 
tools, as it were. And, and, and it, look, some people might not have the feeling of use and freedom of these, of these aspects because, because their lust might have calibrated within it an imprint of, of the last parent functions that have a kind of hold over or, or something like that, or at least perhaps the, the parent function of your ego. Yeah, this is, this is a better explanation. The parent function in your ego might feel contracted by the other parent functions because the other parent functions, because that parent function doesn't, isn't got its ducks in a row with the other parent functions and the other parent functions might kind of be, very prone to taking back control of, of, um, because, because you don't have strong structures that maximize the freedom, um, in your ego functions, parent or, or something like that. So, so the parent function in the ego is, is the source of most development in some sense. And usually if the parent function I'll, I'll just give a, a little vignette on, on, on ADHD. I mean, I, I, look, I mean, this is slightly at the point of pure theory and, and conjecture, but I was talking to someone who had ADHD and she was describing it to me and she said that she was diagnosed with it. So, um, and she's taking medication for it. And I just thought, I think I know what would fix this. And I think I know wh what the problem is. And I just think that it's a badly developed ego because the ego in some sense has to have an integrated subconscious and unconscious. And so I, what I think is happening is that probably the parent function in the unconscious is vulnerable to the inferior of the subconscious. And so the, the ADHD sufferer just keeps on being... Um, crowded by their subconscious yearnings and wants because because any anxiousness on the inferior function in the subconscious is going to um, make their hero function and their child function of their subconscious the prime focus of their whole uh psychological schema because that's going to be it's, it's going to short circuit the unconscious side of the mind and it's going to short circuit uh therefore whatever integration you might get in the ego and so the parent function in the unconscious side of the mind has not wrestled domination of the subconscious and therefore the ego itself has this chink in its armor that it just keeps on regressing and sort of it's prone to this involution of of the subconscious you know sort of concern and so it's just it's com so anyway uh I've, I've kind of described that um and my solution to this is and i had to kind of describe it twice uh i said what you need to do is you need to pretend that you like doing what you are doing so in some sense, you have to kind of be disciplined in some sense. And I'm, I'm explaining it very badly. And, but what I say, when I say that you need to pretend that you like it, I'm not saying that you try to like it. I don't want you to like what you are doing. I want you to force yourself to act as if you like it, to perform and behave as though you would like it. So you are forced to visualize what you think how it looks like people like things from the outside. You, you, and you are forced to play that act, that role. You have to embody that role, that act. In some sense, you have to be able to take your subconscious for granted. You need to know what it's like to take your subconscious for granted. Um, and to have it embodied in, in, a, in, a, in a new inculcated, integrated form, sort of more up the chain. And so, essentially, I think what, what is perhaps happening in ADHD is that people have not learned um, 
they just haven't ever made properly a solid thematic shift that moved their seat of consciousness quite squarely into their unconscious side of the mind. I mean, most people are in the unconscious side of the mind. That, that's, I think, ordinary adulthood, perhaps, is the unconscious side of the mind. They still have an ego, but they, the parent function of their ego doesn't know how to deal with their unconscious's inferior function, which is why they obsess with the, the moral contempl contemplative um, sort of... Uh, so essentially, uh, I didn't... Uh, I've said this in other recordings, I'll just quickly... Do. So the subconscious is like your internal... I, I need to make general comments about this as well. Um, the subconscious, generally speaking, is like your internal preferences. It's like your private values. It, 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 it's very naive. It's very sort of, you know, like, oh, I feel this way. I feel this way. It has the I. I feel or something like that. These are my preferences in my ideal solipsism or whatever. Then the unconscious is what you like about yourself from the outside. It's kind of like you have to look at the I as an object in, in, a, in a broader contemplative domain. So it's almost like you have to look at yourself after you have done something and then judge it. You, you judge what you like from beyond yourself, from outside of yourself. You're looking at yourself in the third person. So the unconscious has to regard the subconscious in the, in, in the third person. It has to... So the unconscious really has a timeless quality to it. It's very close to your conscience. What, what, what you feel in your conscience, which is a paradigm that is beyond the, the subjective first person, it's looking at it from the third person. And then the ego is the hardest integration of both of these two things where you have to kind of make a role for yourself. You have to make a performative role that, that you are embodying um, out of those two component parts. So it's, it's essentially, well, after you look at your morality and your conscience, well, what are you going to do now? Because now you have to do something in reference to those two um, spheres or, or whatever. And I think essentially... The, the mistake or the, or the internal structural vulnerability uh, that is happening in, in ADHD, oh, I, I, I did already describe it, is that the I feel that I want something, the subconscious side of the mind just keeps on its inferior function is not, is not contained by the unconscious's parent function. Or, or, or you could say that the parent function in the subconscious has not delivered the inferior function to the death of the new side of the mind. And so the subconscious never allowed the next side of the mind to inherit its legitimacy or, or to be condoned by its parent function. And so the parent function is still kind of, is still sensitive to... Um, micromanaging the other sides of the mind and so there is no internal structure that facilitates a higher functioning or a, or a more integrated um, perspective on on the higher sides of the mind um, and and that doesn't mean that those higher structures can't develop they just mean that they get derailed so they can still be very sophisticated, but they just get constantly derailed. They go into a different direction because I want now something different because you can't take what I want for granted. And just so in some sense, I think that um, many people with ADHD have well-developed unconscious sides of the mind, but they are uh, uh, and, and or they might it might actually be that they have a weakness in the unconscious side of the mind and they have even a pretty well developed they have a pretty well developed ego as ordinary people go because being derailed has allowed them to protect themselves from their own super ego so because i mean look even people that have these half developed egos their parent function is weak um, against their inferior function it doesn't want to experience the inferior function. 
because it, it has no place to escape after that. Yeah, you know, it, it's just a painful, because essentially, you know, the, the inferior function of the ego is the end of the road. There's no, there's, there's no, you know, there's no doubling down after that. Uh, and so you really have to be willing to, to sacrifice your, your own integrity to, to have the strength to look at the truth as it were, and to, and to find that sin in the ego function. Um, which starts to give you knowledge as to the background of your predicament because it can kind of inform you about the superego and give you a better overarching picture. Um, but again, this is like, you know, the meek will inherit the earth. Um, and why would you do that when, when the parent function is still trying to save perhaps the, um, the child function on the ego? And then, so essentially, I think people with ADHD might actually have even a well-developed parent function in terms of their ego, but because their unconscious never learned how to take the subconscious for granted, as it were, and that's a bit of a summary of a few possible calibrations, but uh, they just keep on tripping back to, to the subconscious. So, I mean, this might also be the development of someone who first develop their subconscious very strongly and then develop their ego very strongly and never develop the unconscious and then use the unconscious vulnerability as a crutch to escape from the uncomfortableness in their ego. Anyway, um, as I say, I think that you can strengthen the unconscious by doing what I said. You need to learn to take the, the subconscious for granted. Um, yeah, so I mean, Learn how to act as though you like things when you don't like them. Know what it would mean like to act like that and, and know what it means from the inside to force yourself to act because then you, I think what that will do is it will, it will stop the subconscious from derailing the unconscious and the unconscious will be able to follow the contemplative moral paradigm to, to start to, because in some sense, I think you have to appreciate the parent function in the unconscious, um, more so than, than the parent function in the subconscious. You need to actually get an internal weighting towards the higher side of the mind, uh, rather than, anyway. Okay, I, I've said that enough. Um, let me just say as well, that I might be wrong about these, them these thematic shifts between the parent functions that they might come in other ways. So I've, I've said, and this might be culturally bound, that essentially that, that the subconscious is like your personal preference and the unconscious is like your, mor your moral paradigm, looking at things from the third person. And your ego is like a kind of actualized role play or an actualized embodied sort of, you know, well, what, what avatar am I going to construct for myself in the immediate, in the world? Now, I think that the, the reason why I say, I think that that is generally true. I think that the only way to segue from one side of the mind to the next side of the mind neatly is by creating a realm for the new, a structure. Sorry, I need to clear my nose. I think that what parent functions might do very badly to one another is when they try to subvert the last parent function by, by trying to crowd in on the same paradigm in some sense. So if the new parent function is not willing to thematically divide itself from the other parent functions, then there's going to be a mafia uh, war of, of, on the ground. There's going to be a territory schism essentially. So I think that it's, it's good. And, and this is what perhaps traditional culture was good at doing is outlining a rubric that each side of the mind could have its own domain. And I think that what keeps people locked in a form of undeveloped in, in under, in not having developed positive sides of the mind is when they try to make the new parent function cut in and go to war with the old side of the mind instead of giving it a new thematic domain as it were now so, so, so that's one variation of 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 what i'm saying but essentially uh 
so it could be that some people have parent functions doing different things. And some people might have parent functions trying to do the same thing. And there might be different categories of different things. I, I, have, I, I think what I said is relatively true because I think that that is the only, the only thing that makes sense. I mean, it might be that there might be some developmental challenges where the ego, maybe, maybe because of the emotional tone, because of the super ego, emotional tone circuitry, maybe the first side of the mind that starts to get, that starts to build itself is the unconscious side of the mind. Uh, I'm speculating to some degree because I'm not exactly sure. Essentially, the, those emotional tones don't happen on one side of the mind. They happen always on more than one side of the mind. So emotional tones are constructed out of um, cognitive functions that are that are impinging on one another or, or convoluting each other from different sides of the mind. But, but anyway, um, so, so there, there might be different ways in which this manifests in a, in a cause I, I'm trying to, to explain what, what is happening on the level of architecture, on the level of meta type. Um, anyway, um, uh, so I think that, that the parent functions are, um, there might be other moves that people make. And for example, certain kinds of narcissism um, with uh, uh, borderline personality disorder and, and things like that. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think if it is, if it is borderline. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but uh, it's weird because this is different to to uh, i'm thinking of a male borderline uh that 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 was narcissistic and he never really had problems with um being different people he never really um he had some level of of uh suggestibility and he had some level of um abrogating accountability onto other people uh that's interesting anyway um so he, I, I wouldn't, he was on the, he, any, anyway, um, so, you know, he would play this game where he would become suggestible so that he could have sort of an external locus of control and sort of try to develop a bit of a codependent sort of thing, which I do think might also have to do with projecting one side of the mind onto, onto an external entity. Anyway, um. The reason why I bring that up is because that might be another solution to not being able to thematically structure your own parent functions is that you just outsource one of them into projecting them into a kind of codependent. I've got so many recordings on borderline personality disorder. So look at that. I'm not going to repeat that here. Um, but essentially, I think that would fit very much into this kind of um, th this kind of structure. Uh, so, yeah, and 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 so there might also be other psychopathologies where um, either the sides of the mind are thematically assigned the wrong sort of theme because of, uh, and then, and then essentially because that doesn't gel with the natural order ordering of the positive sides of the mind, it has to be revised. And then you're left with sort of quasi structures. You're left with holdovers, which might also be what cause recurring, um, sort of, uh, a kind of, you, you have these endemic structures, which are producing, certain kinds of um, perhaps things like cognitive um, dissonance or aberrant salience. Um, but I do think, uh, I think that kind of aberrant salience that I just spoke about would not be bipolar type one aberrant salience. It would be like bipolar type two, bipolar type one, uh, I, I would say is, um, uh, produced differently. Uh, 
I, I do talk about that in some of my other recordings. I don't want to repeat that here because um, I, I have said it many times. Uh, although it might be hard to go fish for, but it has to do with the the actual circuitry of the emotional tones. But anyway, um, moving on. Okay, so um, let me get back to what I was saying about uh, speculating about therapy. So I think what should happen is that the vanity needs to have its own local inferior function and sin equated into its own structure so that you know the sin inherent in any vanity of that side of the mind. And I think that if you do that, you have proven that you have a kind of transcendental knowledge, that you have a kind of integration with your own internal, you know what's happening inside yourself. So you don't need to know what the parent function says. You don't need to know what the, um, what the inferior function says, and you don't need to know what the sin says because the vanity knows that itself. The vanity is already sensitive to all of that. And that's what I call a perfected vanity. And at the point at which you have a perfected vanity, then you've got your troubleshooting kit ready to go. And then all you have to do is stop the child function. You just stop the lust. So you just know what the cognitive function is. You kind of know how to, uh, I mean, because using my 17 model, you can sort of know what it, what, how it should operate in the ideal. Um, and you just try to stop it. You just try to control your own mind, essentially. And you won't be able to because there'll be holdovers or whatever. And then when you when you notice that you're operating from a vanity, then you you under, you, you because your vanity is perfected, you can re retrace the um, yeah. And I guess what's also important essentially is. Um, Okay, now, okay, so I, I think I've said everything I'm going to say, uh, intelligent novel about speculation on therapy. The two other sort of theories that I'm toying with, but they're a bit bad, but um, they might have some interesting components to them, but uh, the, 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 other thing that I just want to say is that how it is very interesting that the sin of the ego is the death of the super ego. And maybe it's not true that that sin. Gives you if you don't know that it's the death of of the super ego, essentially the death that's connected to the parent function, which is what I would call the false prophet. Perhaps that sin is the lake of fire that that essentially you can put the false prophet in um, because you can kind of use it to clean up the um, that initiating sort of parent function uh, that's that's working its way in the background as the god of the world. Um, as an avatar of the God of the world and as a false prophet. Um, because in some sense, you can maybe attribute your sin to that false prophet and then sort of, I don't know, I don't know, this might seem like you're making an excuse. For yourself I mean in some sense I think you have to understand that it's wrong I mean I know that sin you might have to take it forward into into the lust of the false prophets or the child of the false prophets and into the vanity of the false prophet and maybe it's only the vanity of the false prophet which can serve as the lake of fire for the false prophet because once you know the vanity of the false prophet and you maybe perfect that vanity as well and then you maybe treat the sin of the false prophet or the lust of the false prophet uh, 
sorry, which is the sin of your ego, but is the child of the false prophet, then uh, and is the lust of the false prophet, uh, that you do the same thing, but for the super ego. So you perfect the vanity of the super ego, and then you, then you switch off the lust or the child function of the super ego, and that kind of, in epistemological sense, ties it all up in a bow. The only issue is, is that like, I don't know if people actually have the capability to do that, because as far as I know, like you, you are your ego, you can't not be your ego. And the ego only has certain liberty. And that certain liberty does include the sin, which is the death of the, of the false prophet, or the, the death that is connected to the super ego, which is where the false prophet is. So the false prophet being the parent function of the super ego. Um, and by the way, all your parent functions are essentially, or at least the parent function of the subconscious and, and, and the unconscious are also false prophets for the next side of the mind, by the way. But essentially the, the super ego's um, false prophet is the prime false prophet or, or the first. So thinking that that has a sort of a special significance. Um, okay. Yeah, so anyway, the, 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 these are sort of, um, you know, it's, it's still sort of early days. This is only the sixth day of this new model. Um, but it's certainly, I think everything is coming together nicely. So, uh, it's just also where to find these emotional tones exactly, um, where, where to place those. Anyway, okay, that's, that's I guess the end of this recording.